Sassy men, soy boys, and grown-ass men in their soft era is on trend, and much of it is a good thing. A new era of masculinity is emerging. More and more men are reimagining the boundaries of manhood and uncoupling it with the performative masculinity and its grandiose and in many ways inhumane expectations of them. From 10-step elaborate skincare routines to furnishing aesthetic apartments to simply lighting a candle and having a glass of wine challenges the toxic masculine stereotype of manhood and maleness. At its best, living softly is a movement that allows people to live a gentler life. But with regard to men, it expands the conversation around what men can and should do. This is progress. Most men, straight, cis, trans, and queer alike have all internalized these ideas of hegemonic masculinity, right? A cis hetero, dominant, emotionally distant provider. And for those of us who can't be straight and aren't cisgender, the very least that we can do is attempt to be masculine and stoic in our presentation, right? No sense in being a complete fuck up. But with the rise of these images, stories, and examples, more men are seeing it's okay to be soft. And there is more than one way to be both male and valuable. And this value is intrinsic and is not based on production. This, this is progress. But much like any progress in the digital age, social media has its objections. The opposition comes in many shapes, genders, and with a bevy of reasons why men going soft means the downfall of society. And some of their critique holds weight, but most of it, hypocritical. A soft life for women is something society can get behind because docility is a social conditioning that we raise women under. But as men embrace more self-care, less work, and the quiet luxury of self-actualization, we're quickly reminded of the social consequences of being feminine and male at the same time. Fear, femphobia, queerphobia, and misogyny become the logic that undergirds the arguments of those folk attempting to articulate why you should want to be an alpha male. A lot of the, the new women are men. Because nowadays you ask a man, why you buy me flowers? He's like, did you buy me flowers? Hello, who the princess? But men and masculine identified folk don't have to be alpha to be worthy. Don't have to be providers to be valuable. And dare I say, don't have to be hard to be fuckable. <laughs> men are in a new era of masculinity, a softer era. So why do y'all hate that? Hey, homegirl, homeboy, and homies. Welcome and are welcome back to my corner of the internet. Hey, <laughs> if this is your first time ever seeing my face, my name is Herbie, Herbie Ravales. My pronouns are he, she, him, her, hers, and hers. And yes, that does me. How do I? That I wear pants, skirts, pearls, ID purses, yeah. Isn't this such a cute bag? I got it from the thrift um, for a photo shoot that I did last year and I never have an outfit to ever actually wear it with. I'm going for something really soft today, obviously on par with the topic of today's video. Um, and I felt that this, and I felt that this little clutch really just is in alignment with that. So ooh, will you sit up? Girl, she's been through a lot. She's from the thrift, daddy. She's from the thrift. So unless you've been living under a rock, you have heard of the soft life trend and really the soft life movement, right? And even if you haven't heard of it, you are familiar with its aesthetic and imagery. It's inescapable on the internet these days, particularly in black corners of the internet. I feel like it is multiplying on itself. Or maybe that's just because that's the corner of the internet that I'm in. I don't know. The themes are simple. It's about living a life and particularly and almost exclusively a life that women are gaining more access to that epitomizes gentleness and grace. It's a life of relaxation, peace, and slow living. It's giving pastel monochromatic fits. It's giving gold jewelry and gold jewelry exclusively. It's giving, you know, champagne toasts and a perfect balance of like building community, nightlife, vacating, and also consistent organization. Love them bad for doing those things. <laughs> and I'll be the first to acknowledge that while we're gonna be talking about soft life with regard to men and it's gonna be, soft life is gonna be kind of the catalyst for the conversation. We're gonna be talking about so much more in this new era of masculinity and men embracing the feminine, right? But I'll be the first to say that women deserve a soft life. And in particular, women of color, but especially black women, right? Who have historically and contemporarily had to be responsible for labor deemed both feminine and masculine. It makes complete sense why people need a respite and a break from bitch America. But I really want to take an opportunity or take this opportunity to examine the bigger picture, right? To examine the more holistic human picture, right? So I just wanna start with this. We live in a time in American history where there are way more available jobs than people to take them kind of right there's over 10 million jobs available and only 5.7 million people who are 
what we would call unemployed workers, right? So that means even if every single one of these people got a job today, there'd still be over 4 million jobs available on the market. Now, the quality of these jobs and the subsequent quality of life after getting these jobs remains to be seen, which is why they, they remain vacant. <laughs> Girl, fuck you. I'm not working at Amazon. As a matter of fact, Amazon is laying bitches off. Girl, it's a lot going on in that political sphere. So we're not gonna get into that. This is our reality right? That's what I want us to focus on, right? People aren't running toward employment. People are running towards peace and happiness and a softer, slower, gentler life. I mean, there, and there are a number of theories out there with regard to what changed, particularly after the pandemic. Um, but that's not my job. Okay. Um, and that's not what we're going to be talking about today. Maybe that's another topic for another day. The fact still remains that more and more people, irrespective of gender, are in the process of renegotiating their relationship to labor and cross-analyzing the consequences and the benefits of engaging with the labor market in the way that we've been socialized and trained to engage with it. Um, and I think that that is, that is where a unique opportunity and a new challenge for men and masculine identified folk is presenting itself, right? Because what happens happens when the people who we have indoctrinated into the idea that in order for them to be valuable they must produce um they must provide and those same people are saying mm, that sounds like a bag of shit i've been sold a bag of goods and inside of it is bullshit right and so i'm gonna divest from that what happens to the culture what happens to a society like that um, and is it safe for them to do that thing? Now, it's important to note here that as we're talking about these issues pertaining to men, um, and we're going to be talking about it across racial lines and, you know, sexual proclivity, I'm going to be using terms like us and we, you know, in including myself in the conversation. And for those of you who are new here, or maybe even those of you who have been here a while are probably like, well, duh, bitch, <laughs> you got a big back, you's a man. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Watch them out. But I identify as an effeminate, non-binary person, right? And I feel like that's the identity that fits me best. It, I finally found the language that fits who I am, right? Um, and not the language that I've been given, right? Um, and not who I've been socialized to be. And so my identity is not up for debate. It's not. And neither is yours. But it is up for interpretation. It is to say that I understand that people will perceive me and interpret me as a black man, irrespective of how I identify, right? And so that has, that comes with a host of complications, challenges, and privileges living in this male body. Um, but the complications really come from living in this black male body, right? Um, and from my queerness and from my femininity and a, and a host of other things, right? Poverty and girl, we could be here all day. But it's important that when I have a conversation about softness and femininity as it intersects with manhood, that I include myself in this conversation, one, because yes, my intersections, but two, also because of the privileges and the challenges that my body affords me, all of this shit is resonative, right? I also just want to say here that you are going to notice that I'm going to be a little bit more verbose, verbose in today's video um and that's because i'm in my academic bag because this channel is a melting pot you never know what you're gonna get when you show up and it's fine if the informative academic style of herbie is not for you i have many videos that'll make you laugh that'll make you think and a couple that might make you cry and so if those are the videos that you want to engage with They'll be in the description box and they're all throughout my channel. And I've been thinking for a while about creating a separate channel for the social commentary and for the more informative based videos. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Type while I'm talking things. Now, on to the subject matter of today's video. I think the challenge a lot of men are, fa are facing now with regard to participating and engaging with um, the culture that is being created around living a soft life, right? Um, and engaging with femininity in a new way is the kind of challenge many of us have always been accustomed to, right? But particularly cishet, straight, masculine presenting men have not had to engage with. And that's the response to you doing life on your own terms. And the response for people living in male bodies who express femininity and try to express, you know, the fullness of who they're, the, excuse me, the fullness of who they are is usually femphobia, right? Femphobia. And I've done a lot of research or just a lot of reading for this video. And in my reading, I came across this article written for the medium by Faith J. Day. Um, and it's entitled, Not Just for Ladies, How Men Are Leading a Soft Life Online. And in it, she says, living a soft life knows no gender. 
While many women are singing the praises of their soft girl era, these tips and tricks apply to anyone living under late stage capitalism. However, due to the expected performance of masculinity, the representation of men in media and reality is usually not aligned with the soft life. Socially and culturally, it is easier for women to embrace a soft life because of the ethos of this movement, excuse me, because the ethos of this movement aligns with the traditional values we are taught. By the way, this is a black woman. Beginning in childhood, little girls are conditioned to be docile and well-mannered, wearing fuzzy clothing and playing quiet and clean games such as attending imaginary tea parties and dance recitals. In contrast, boys are pushed outside to get dirty and to roughhouse. And while little girls are expected to learn how to cook and clean inside the house, stereotypical boy, stereotypical boy chores focus on dirty and outdoorsy tasks like taking out the trash and cutting the lawn. Now, there are a couple different directions we can take this when we're looking at what are the consequences and the benefits of raising boys and girls with this this gendered script and i think that when we explore the ways in which we raise little boys and girls with these gendered scripts of what it is that boys do and what it is that girls do we realize that we're creating or we're consistently replicating and recreating the same codependency that a lot of us see in our grandparents and in some cases our parents right this codependent dynamic of i am but a half until i find my whole right as a masculine person i need a feminine part to complete me because i can't express that within myself it is not desirable it is not safe it's just not feasible for me right and, and, a, and in contrast a similar thing can be said to those people who are socialized to be um feminine right i think also too we could look at the way these same little dirty boys were raising snotty nose boys are gonna grow up to be dirty men right dirty men who were never taught to nurture who were never taught to be domestic who were never taught to emote who were never taught to communicate right and they become grown dirty men who are in a position where they can weaponize their incompetence right against their feminine partner and that usually takes the form of a woman but it, not always excuse me <laughs> not always right right but still that work and that labor becomes incumbent upon the feminine person in that dynamic if there's a feminine person within the dynamic right every relationship is different but what i am talking about here is the feminine and what i'll be talking about for a lot of this video is the feminine masculine dynamic relational dynamic right because that emotional and physical actual labor becomes incumbent upon someone right also this framework of scripted gender creates the conditions for women to view relationship and sex and men as transactional experiences and, and laborious ones, right? That's why a lot of times if some if a woman has two kids and a husband, she'll be like, yeah, I have three kids. And a lot of times we comedicize men's weaponization of their incompetence. And not every man or masculine identified person is weaponizing their incompetence, but I wonder what the world would look like if we started to hold men to a specific standard where they were responsible for engaging with, you know, femininity, right? But I also think that softer and more feminine men can be a useful resource and tool for those of us who are attracted to men or for those of you who are raising little boys to show dirty boys, right? That there's a way to grow up and be a supportive, clean, domestic, softer, emotionally intelligent man. But that can't really be the conversation. That can't really be the conversation because of a couple of things, right? Men just living a softer life doesn't create those conditions. It, it also ignores the risk associated with men embracing femininity, right? And there is grave risk associated with that. And I also think even more nefarious than that is just being a feminine guy, a softer guy, does not undo, you know, the power structure of patriarchy right like you being a nice guy who changes diapers and who knows how to cook does not create a more equitable experience for women femmes and effeminate folk um it does not create a more equitable reality for people navigating feminine experiences and it doesn't undo white supremacist patriarchy i think that there's something to be said about how you know, having these symbols of men who are showing up as more feminine can obscure some of the responsibility that men um, and particularly masculine men have to undo systems that were created by other men. Right. And I think that that's all of our work, but we have different roles um in undoing white supremacist capitalist patriarchy some of us have larger roles than others and it's not it's not anybody's fault that they were born on the body that they were born in that they have certain privileges but it is a responsibility of being aware of that and i just feel like 
something more nefarious could happen within all of the things but we'll talk more about that later right now i want to focus a little bit more on the risk factor that i spoke about earlier with regard to men embracing femininity right what do they stand to lose what do they stand to gain what are the social consequences of that and i think men risk losing desirability risk losing perceived worthiness and valuability but also as you embrace femininity people in society will strip masculinity from you right and we exist in a society where masculinity particularly for men is inextricably linked to humanity right and i spoke about this before in the other video that i did um drake and the rise of sassy black men but i want to expound on it just a little bit more america is a white supremacist capitalist patriarchal christian nation and it's important to note the christian piece because the tentacles of fundamentalist white christian indoctrination are very fucking long okay so long that even those folk who don't identify as christian but exist in this society are still affected by that indoctrination right because it's it's socio-psychological right and by that i mean it infects and impacts all of our minds and the way that we engage because it's inescapable right um the ideas around masculinity and femininity are woven into the fabric of american society right um, our cultural norms, the, it, it's just everywhere. Boys don't cry, boys wear blue, girls wear pink. And there's a lot of social correction for people who disrupt that white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal, Christian idea of male masculinity, you know, female femininity, and all girl, intersex folk just don't exist within this paradigm. And just to go a little bit deeper on this, because within Christianity, and, and in particular, white supremacist, capitalist, Christianity, right um it's understood that not only is god masculine but in essence so is everyone else so is the rest of humanity and follow me right obviously we know god created adam first and from adam he created eve right and so her existence is only by virtue of a man whenever the bible refers to the entirety of humanity it's always man god so loved man and man 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 Bad. it's a lot of that but even outside of the biblical context because we live in this system whether we're actually in the christian faith or not like i said so even outside of the you know biblical context we refer to humanity and all of humanity as mankind never womankind i think and i think we're just getting to a place as a country where we're beginning to say congresswoman where we're beginning to say policewoman um or even use gender neutral terms like firefighter as opposed to fireman but masculine identity is our pseudo objective identity for humanity, right? It is our go-to gender. And I think this is an unconscious truth that we all understand. As men, we're acutely aware of that, right? We are acutely aware of what that means and how the power you wield in a male body is contingent upon really your masculinity, right? Um, among other things, but largely <laughs> your masculinity. And even before we begin to understand the misogyny, the femphobia and the queerphobia that undergirds the rearing of child boys, we all understand that the worst thing you can be as a young boy and an adult man is feminine, is soft. And this truth compounds on itself at the intersection of race and sexual orientation and it, I think it becomes really volatile when we start to look at how this engages with blackness. When you're sitting at the intersection of being a racialized person of color um, and also a man and you drop femininity in that bucket, things get tricky. And that's not to say, you know, being white and feminine and male is necessarily celebrated everywhere or exalted or embraced by everyone all, all throughout the society. No, but it is to say that hypermasculinity is not a prerequisite for worthiness, for acceptance and for access to love, care and safety um, in the ways that it is for men of color. I did read in, and I'll, and I'll link it in the description below or just put it on the Patreon. Studies show that Asian men are deemed the least attractive on dating apps and that's because in large part due to their the perception of their femininity. And the same study goes on to say that further work on same-sex pairing suggests that gay men also subscribe to the racial and gender hierarchies that view gay men, excuse me, that view Asian men as more feminine than other men. And I think this just furthers the point that we're all participating participating and engaging with this hierarchy of you know femininity and desirability on the basis of features gender hue 
body size. When we look at the queer community specifically, it becomes a little bit more nuanced because I do think that while not everywhere, girl, because famphobia runs rampant through the queer community. And we're going to talk about that extensively one of these days, girl. Get my panties in a bunch. Um, but I do think that there are much more, you know, queer men who are attracted to feminine men than there are women who are attracted to feminine men. I'm going to challenge this later in the video, which is interesting, but just follow me. But even when maybe masculine men or other feminine men are attracted to feminine men, it's all on the basis of who gets to be a, quote, pretty boy. Who gets to operate in a body that other queer men deem a body that is worthy of protection, of safety, security? Because even in the queer community, we understand that you're not safe. You are more unsafe operating in a visibly and perceptibly feminine queer body than you are in a body of a queer person who can pass, right? So that is to say that feminine queer men do need more protection from their community and in particular their significant other right but who gets to be the recipient of that protection if we are operating in the same hierarchy of who is feminine and who is not and who is desirable and, and subsequently who's desirable and who is not on the basis of color hue features and race right um and i've always said this being a dark-skinned male i've always felt like in order for me to be viewed as desirable while presenting as feminine i must be pristine incredibly clear skin outfit a clean cut soft life monochromatic tones right otherwise my only other alternative living in this dark body is to perform hyper masculinity right because that's the expectation that people have of me now i do think that this becomes more nuanced when we start looking at body size height Right. And it's why a, there's a viral sound right now on TikTok. How does it feel to be a six foot bottom? How does it feel being a six foot bottom built like a tad and thumping around that? Right. <laughs> and that gets to be a read. Right. Because there's a perception that we have when you are a certain height, a certain hue, a certain size, a certain shape, a certain race with certain features that you are to be more masculine. And I think that it's particularly sad in the queer community where we should be more imaginative when it comes to constructing relationship, right? We shouldn't be just having to look at the feminine masculine dynamic. We should be able to create our own rules. Now, if you are a feminine girl who wants a masculine girl, then, then do that. Okay, I, I'm not blaming you. I'm attracted to a wide array of men, but anyway, I'm getting off topic and getting on some personal shit. I just think that in order for people like myself or who are not like myself, but who live in bodies where you are supposed to be a certain thing, it creates a condition in which you have to either perform that thing and bury the rest of who you are in order to be deemed socially desirable, socially acceptable, to be a, a recipient of the love, care and affection and intimacy that you deserve. And that sucks, particularly for Latin and black men with a special emphasis on black men. It's because we're indoctrinated into a kind of hardness, right? We're indoctrinated into a kind of machismo. <laughs> I had to say that with an thing. Right. And that reminds us that in order to be desirable, in order to be worthy, you must be a brute. You must be a real nigga. But all black men, cis, straight, queer, trans, and even folk who are operating in male bodies who are non-binary, we know this right um we know what we're risking by embracing the feminine and whether that's something as simple as a black man sharing his skincare routine and the day in the life content and getting comments like bring real black men back right yo granddaddy wouldn't have did this this new batch of men is different right and i think those kind of comments discourage men from building community and building community around something different or or expressing interest in something that isn't the hyper masculine emotionally distant stoic tasteless you know archetype right it it stops men from expanding and from growing and from exploring and i just feel like men have so much more to offer now i'm gonna pause here and just say that if you guys are still watching comment sage green comment the code sage green for the girls who are still watching this video y'all real ones i think also the consequences are a little bit more um aggressive for those of us who express even more overt femininity right maybe wearing makeup maybe wearing acrylic nails or maybe wearing androgynous clothing right and we're having to navigate these spaces in real life and online where we're consistently reminded that 
you know, femmes and feminine presenting queer men, there's no space for us in the sexual imaginations or the romantic realities of other queer men. And that sucks because one, I know that not to be true. I know that not to be true in real life, but I think we are all trying to navigate this experience. And so online, like I always say this, give me five minutes with any man and he's mine. I'm not, I'm, I'm going off, I'm going too, too far off. Um, in this same article that I quoted earlier, Faith says, much of what can be viewed as the soft boy or the clean man aesthetic is constantly called out online and in online comments as pandering or being solely for the ladies. Primarily ascribed to the music from the LL Cool J's, the Drake's of the world, creative content that is classified as for the ladies usually precludes other men from publicly liking or affiliating themselves with that content. This is partly due to the desired audience, but secondarily due to a certain sexist disregard that comes with the content geared toward women's visual and visible pleasure. And I'll, exp I'll expand that by saying, you know, to anything that panders to feminine folks' desires and pleasure um, or anything that we would be drawn to. She goes on to say, I think it's also a sign that men are evolving, even in the face of so much media and public perception, perception that says otherwise. And whether it's for the ladies or for themselves, this evolution should be celebrated and not ridiculed, especially as we move into an era where people seek a whole person instead of a better half. It is heartening to see representations of men and masculine identified folk embracing activities and ideologies that are not always coded as such, primarily because it's been too long and also because it's about damn time. And I feel like I keep talking about this through the lens of femininity, of love, intimacy, and self-esteem, because so often when we talk about the needs of black people, and in particular black men, we talk about them from a basic perspective, right? We talk about them from the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And if you're unfamiliar, I'll just put it right there on the screen so that you can see as well. We talk about it from the physical needs of men and the safety and security needs of men, right? And sometimes we address the respect of men, but that's drawn from the same basic ideas and concepts. It's always from a space of survival, but black people too and black men deserve to thrive, right? And a part of that thriving means achieving happier, healthier relationships, a part of that thriving means creating spaces for true freedom, freedom to feel, freedom to create, freedom to produce on your own terms, and freedom to live a gentler, softer male experience, right? This perspective invites the idea that men too sometimes need to be held, they need to be heard, and they need to be listened to. And so if we can create the kind of spaces and affirm a softer life for men, a more a new era of masculinity where men are embracing more feminine feminine activities. Then we can create a strong community that enables men to achieve self-actualization, right? So to where a whole person is who you are engaging with as a person who's attracted to masculine identified men. I don't know. I think more men would be able to achieve their fullest, most authentic selves if the boundaries around masculinity opened up just a lot of bit. Just a lot of bit, right? Black boys are required to be rough and tough, to suck up the pain and not shed a tear. If you get into a fight, you better win the fight. I'ma beat your ass when you get home. It's a phrase I've heard too many times from friends and family throughout my life. As men in a white supremacist patriarchal society, our masculinity is always directly tied to violence, right? Like to be a man in this society means to have the capacity for um, and the capacity to enact immense violence and do immense harm to people stronger than you and, and definitely, definitely to those weaker than you whenever the situation arises. And this kind of hyper-masculinity isn't unique to black men or men of color. Um, I think it's a colonized understanding, a, a vestige of manifest destiny, right? But I think for black boys who come from black men, who come from black men, who come from sons of formerly enslaved men, we understand that manhood um, and masculinity is not something that we should have access to, right? All of the perceived respect and power and privilege that comes with being a man, we are not supposed to have access to that and we understand that. And so the rules of engagement change. In order to be a man, a real man in the black community, you have to be twice as violent, twice as aggressive, twice as harmful in order to be half the man 
half the human. Our response to this socialization, though it is birthed from poverty, depravity, desperation, is always gonna be morphed into an issue of morality and bestiality. Niggas ain't shit. It's gonna continue to be niggas ain't shit. And while I, I am often on the niggas ain't shit train, cause a lot of times you niggas don't be a fuck ass piece of shit. I'm talking about, you know, when you twerk like this on the toilet just to get that last little piece of shit out, you ain't even that, okay? Sometimes niggas don't even be that. When I'm wiggling and tickling and trickling and brr, just to get that last little piece of shit out, you niggas don't even be that. However, <coughs> however, men embracing a soft life is an opportunity to escape that black male beast narrative. In the same way that women embracing a soft life is a way for them to escape the strong black woman narrative. And so what we're all searching for is humanity. What we're all searching for is authenticity, rest, respite, and just to at least be that last little piece of shit. <laughs> Men can cook, can clean, can meditate, can cry, can emote, can communicate, can increase their emotional intelligence. But most of all, and I think most important, men can express that they too do not dream of labor. Before I give my final thoughts on the matter, I do want to say that the full length version of this video is offered exclusively on my Patreon, along with the work cited with all of the studies and the research and the articles that I've read for this video. So tiptoe your beautiful ass over to the Patreon and support me. If you support what I do, if you love what I do, if you love me, donate five, ten, twenty five or two dollars to your boy, your girl, your whole girl. Um, and the link will be in the description box below. <laughs> I think what I touched on in addition to what you've already heard is the studies that support why women prefer more feminine men and men, black men specifically, is relationship to labor in this country. Good stuff. Good stuff. It's still pull up on me. Um, in conclusion, I'll say that men living a softer life looks a number of ways. And men engaging with femininity looks, you know, even more innumerable. And I think that just because a man wants to be softer or is engaging with femininity, that doesn't mean that he's going to be, you know, more domestic or, you know, less misogynistic, less femphobic. Um, but it does mean that he may be more inclined to communicate um anyone who's willing to undo one facet or a couple of facets of white supremacist capitalist patriarchal understandings of manhood and maleness can be persuaded to really look at it from instead of a macro perspective a more micro perspective right i think there's a lot of work to be done within the movement of soft life for both women and men um, I think it makes complete sense. People should not be working themselves to death, in particular black men. And if you've seen the Patreon portion of this video, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But yeah, I don't know. I, I really want to know what you guys think. What do you think? Do you think that there is pushback around men living a soft life? Do you think it's safe for men to want rest? Do you think this new era of masculinity is going to create more independent human beings who are looking for another whole person? Or do you think that it is the downfall of society and that everything I've said is miss fucking informed? Fuck me. Um, let me know in the comments down below. Um, be sure to watch one of these videos over here. But you know, I'll never leave you without saying this. I am in a constant state of practice. And so are you. You can never fail when you're in a constant state of practice. I love you. Subscribe to the Patreon, and I'll see you next week. Bye, world.